So we are talking about shoulder instability, and uh, let's see. Uh, Jennifer, what do you think of this case? All right. So there's edema-like marrow signal intensity within the posterior superior aspect of the humeral head. So I'm concerned about a hill sax lesion, recent shoulder dislocation. Yeah, so here we have some increased signal and displacement of the anterior labrum. Um, Bankers. Okay, so. Well, it says acute hill sex. Okay. So, which we see, we see a small impaction factor for posterior loose and marrow edema. Okay, and bank heart lesion. So, we do see a uh, anterior inferior labral tear. Looks separate. Okay, so here's another patient with an acute hill sex lesion, which we see here with the uh, kind of edema with indistinct margins. And here the patient came back to see this is 2205, and notice by two months later, it really looks more chronic. You know, you now no longer have the indistinct margins. You have very distinct margins of the hill sex injury, and we really don't see any adjacent bone marrow edema. So it takes somewhere between two and six weeks, typically, for the bone marrow edema pattern to resolve uh, when you have these kind of bone injuries. A little bit of... Probably a little uh, degenerative change of that anterior labrum without a displaced labral tear. Okay, Ashu, what do you think of this one? So we have um, a 68 year old male with shoulder pain, weakness, and loss of range of motion for two months. We have uh, two coronal images. Looks like there's quite a bit of edema within the superior aspect of the humeral head. It looks like a defect there as well. Um, be concerned about. Um, this uh, a hill sax lesion and there's uh, some uh, yeah and then there's an anterior labral there's looks like an a superior labral tear there where do you see and, the superior and, labral tear oh is that just one second oh is that just fat signal so that's fat within the uh joint space yes. yeah majorly bone fat that's extruded into the joint space from the fracture yeah and uh, what else do you see there in terms of the bones? Yeah, it looks like the glenoid, there's a defect of the inferior glenoid there. Yeah, with a little displaced fragment here. And right. Probably a tear of the inferior capsule as well. And uh, here's kind of axial images showing the impaction here, the fat within the, uh, the joint space. And uh, uh, the part of the anterior and inferior uh, uh, Injury. Uh, th this is a little bit different location. This is more of a, a really more of an inferior dislocation. Uh, it's anterior and inferior, but here the hill sax lesion is a little bit more superiorly located than, than normal. But uh, so so this was just an acute, pretty severe, high impact uh, trauma, anterior dislocation, and then some medullary fat has extruded into the joint space, which is pretty uncommon with these because most of these aren't as high a, a impact as that particular lesion uh, injury. All right, so here again, we can see some edema along the posterior superior humeral head with um, cortical depression compatible with the hill sax deformity. And then there's some kind of low signal intensity structure along the anterior labrum. Not sure. Yes. Not sure what that is. And then some increased signal along the anterior inferior labrum. Looks like it could be a non-displaced Bankart lesion. Ah, so here we can see that anterior inferior labrum separates out, so it's actually a labral tear. This is actually a tear of the middle gun humeral ligament, which occurred due to the dislocation. And you often can get tear of the anterior and uh, 
both the middle glenohumeral ligament as well as the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament when it dislocates. Okay. All right. Michael. So. It's a 38-year-old male, three months after sports injury. It looks like there is a more remote hill sax lesion, impaction fracture without significant marrow edema. Um, there's abnormality. It looks like there was also kind of a bony, a little displaced bony Bankart fragment of the anterior glenoid. I think this is going down further. You can see more of that Bankart lesion. And uh, so we're just seeing injury to like kind of the inferior capsule as well. And the, yeah, displaced labrum. Uh, unstable shoulder with hill sacs and an acute uh, uh, bony bank lesion here. And you can also see probably a tear of the cartilage as well as the anterior and inferior labrum. Good. And then here we can see on the axial images, maybe a little bony defect here on the plane, uh, uh, the APV or the plane films. This was a really old study. Really one of the early MR scans of the shoulders. We can see the hill sacs injury uh, here. And we can see the bony bank cart uh, fracture here anteriorly and inferiorly. Okay, uh, Ashi, what do you think of this one? Uh, would you call that a uh, glenoid fracture rather than a bank cart, John? Well, I think people call them bony bank carts. Which is a fracture, so it'd be it's, but it is a fracture of the glenoid, right? How would you prefer it? How would you like it called up? I, I would call it a fracture, right? Okay, uh, yeah. it is a fracture, so that's good. Yep. Okay, Ashu. Um, seems like there's a lot of ameroedema on that first image of the glenoid, and there's a discontinuity of that subchondral plate. Looks like a uh, looks like a fracture right there. And then um, I think we're a little bit more superior. You can look at the humeral head. There's some marrow edema there, but I, I think that's beginning of, of um, it, we, I'd like to go a little bit more superior to see what that looks like. Yeah. But. And then, uh, and then you can, you, when you give these bony bank cart fractures, uh, as you all know, we try to determine what percentage of the anterior posterior diameter of the, uh, uh, glenoid is involved with a uh, bony defect, and here we, I think we'll have a lot of discussion later about how to make these measurements because it's not clear cut in the literature. Uh, different papers measure it different ways, but you basically, typically want to measure the the, the fragment size here, or length here, anterior posterior length, and then uh, divide that by the AP diameter of the what would have been the intact glenoid, and that gives you a percentage of the uh, anterior posterior diameter involved with, with the fracture. Originally, it was felt that uh, if it was around 20 to 25 percent, then that might be okay. Uh, more recent studies now show that there is there are chronic problems, even if it gets down to a 10 percent involvement. So more and more people are doing uh, surgical reconstructions or a ladder J-tap technique which we'll talk about later uh, uh, in, in, in patients who have smaller and smaller areas, uh, percentage areas of involvement of a bone injury, because it turns out you really need the, that anterior 5 to 10% of the glenoid for long-term stability of the glenoid. Uh, let me see. So uh, another way to do these measurements would be to take the sagittal images, uh, and this instead of, uh, and here you do a, uh, a circle measurement of where you think that inferior pair of the of the glenoid is, and then measure a radial diameter uh, across in an oblique pattern where you go perpendicular to the fracture site. Almost all the papers in the literature do not image it that way, because most of them come from CT data, and as all they had to measure off of uh, before were just the axial images. Obviously, with CT, now you get reconstructions and you can measure these oblique angles. Uh, I, I, the, the problem with just measuring it in the axial plane is that 
Uh, you can get vastly different measurements depending upon which slice you use. If you go to the best fit circle method uh, and do a, a perpendicular image, I think it's a more reproducible measurement uh, of that distance, and I think it's uh, 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 more significant. So uh, I, I prefer to measure these on the uh, oblique sagittal images right on FOSS with the glenoid. Uh, draw a circle here that best fits what I think the native glenoid uh, would be, and then draw lines perpendicular to the fracture to get the percentage of involvement. This is a very high percentage. This patient's going to need a, a bony augmentation. Yeah. So th there's a lot of debate at some of the Kern and Job uh, uh, meetings we've had recently. There's been this discussion about whether you should fix the boat, the fracture here, uh, uh, or whether you should just do a coracoid transfer, which we'll talk about later, uh, later and take the coracoid and attach it to the bone here for, for stability. And there are people who argue b both things. Uh, I think it was either, it was this Wednesday, I think this Wednesday there was a case like this, uh, and Michael Banfi discussed this as a case very similar to this one, where he elected to do a reconstruction to, for the native anatomy rather than doing a coracoid transfer. Uh, it depends upon a lot of factors, a lot of the patient's uh, preference and, and the surgeon's comfort. What we do know is that the coracoid transfers lead to very uh, reproducibly stable shoulders. Uh, doing a kind of a native reconstruction, there isn't as much data to support that. So most of the literature would measure kind of this way, uh, where you measure in the, in the axial plane. Uh, but again, I prefer the best fit circle method. And, uh, and uh, originally, the study showed using the, this linear method in the axial plane that uh, if you had greater than 25% uh, uh, involvement, then you needed to do some sort of bony augmentation. Now most people uh, would say really less than 20%. You really have to be around 10 to 15% to be comfortable leaving it. Okay, and here's just another example with a big Hill Sachs impaction injury and a Bancar fracture. Uh, here is markedly irregular. And here's another thing: where do you measure it? <laughs> if you measure it through here you're going to get a very high percentage involvement. If you measure it kind of down through here, other areas it won't be. But th this, is a, this is a big one. This is one who would, that nowadays some people would stabilize this and try to get native anatomy back. Other people would just do a core code transfer. Here you can see part of the argument. One of the arguments is that you, you frequently damage the articular cartilage here when you have these fractures. So even if the bone heals, you're going to have this large area of... Uh, chondromalacia anteriorly. Uh, on the other hand, if you do a coracoid transfer and, and bring the coracoid process down here, which I think we'll talk about, uh, it's it's not anatomic. You certainly uh, won't have normal articular cartilage here, uh, but it will be stable. Okay. Uh, so whenever you, well, uh, for many of the orthopedic surgeons that we deal with, uh, if you see these kind of injuries, what they want to know is, is this uh, uh, hill sex impaction on track or off track? And I think this can be a little bit confusing. There are a number of papers about this. But basically, if you move the, the humeral head, the articulating surface of the humeral head, which articulates with the glenoid, varies depending upon the positioning of the humeral head. So at 150 degrees of abduction, uh, the articulation is very high on the humeral head, uh, and at other degrees, it's, it's much lower. So if you follow it, it really in cadavers, you'll find that the articulation with the glenoid in normal physiologic motion goes right along a track right through here. So the theory is that if you have a hill sacs injury, which is wholly contained within the tract, then uh, the 
uh, glenoid will slide nicely and smoothly. I mean, the humeral head will glide nicely and smoothly on the glenoid because you'll have uh, articular cartilage of the humeral head, both anteriorly and posteriorly, which will articulate with the glenoid, and, and you won't have any, then you'll have a smooth gliding of the humeral head on the glenoid. So that would be an on-track lesion, which means uh, you don't have to do anything particular. Uh, the patient will do very well. If, however, the hill sacs lesion extends off the track onto the side, then you'll start getting areas where it will engage and not engage, and therefore you'll no longer have smooth tracking of the humeral head with respect to the glenoid. That's an off-track lesion, and that typically then means that you need other surgeries to keep the person from engaging and disengaging the, the hill sacs injury. So there are a number of papers that have kind of looked at uh, how to do this. Uh, 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 this is one uh, paper in skeletal radiology where they use basically the axial method. Uh, here's kind of a best fit circle, but they still uh, measure in the, in the axial plane between the, the diameter of the native glenoid and the diameter of the uh, bony band cart injury. And then they measure the glenoid track by taking the big D times 0.83. This, the 0.83 is a number which was determined empirically on a, on a series of studies in cadavers. <clears throat> and then if you subtract the little d, that will give you uh, the size of the glenoid tract. That's how big uh, of the glenoid uh, is for the uh, articulation with the humeral head. Uh, and then you can measure the uh, hill sacs uh, interval here. The hill sacs interval is the size of the bony defect plus any distance between the bone and the infraspinatus tendon. I generally find this little uh, 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 the, the distance here between the bone and the interval to be to be very small. Uh, so the hero sacs animal is the sum of these two. And the saying goes is that if the hill sacs interval is larger than the glenoid track, then there's going to be por portions of the hill sacs which are going to be off the track of the glenoid, and that would be an off-track lesion. And then we'll have to think about other surgical procedures to keep this patient from clunking uh, when, when, when they move their shoulder. If the heel sacs interval here is less than the size of the glenoid tract, then it should articulate smoothly on the, on the uh, glenoid and not require uh, additional concern. So you look to see if the heel sacs interval is less than the glenoid tract, then it's on track. Uh, uh, so, uh, and it will not engage. If the hill sacs interval is greater than a glenoid tract, then it's likely to engage. So there are several things that the surgeons look for in trying to determine how to treat these patients, and they've divided them into four different groups. Group one is if the glenoid injury is less than 25% of the AP diameter, and it's an on-track lesion, and then you can just do a bank cart repair. Uh, if, uh, the glenoid lesion is less than 25%, but you have a large hill sacs, so it's an off-track lesion, then you can do a glenoid repair, but then a remplissage. A remplissage is basically a soft tissue procedure where uh, you sew down the posterior capsule so that it limits the motion of the shoulder so that you don't get into a position uh, with motion where you uh, clunk, where you engage the hill sacs lesion. Then if the, if the glenoid lesion is greater than 25% and it's on track, you do a glenoid augmentation. It's either doing a, uh, trying to do a, uh, uh, here if you, so if you think you can repair the, the bone to bone and get good bone to bone healing, then it, then it would be a repair of that, which is what we saw a couple of days ago in the, in the, uh, uh, in, in the Curlin Job lecture, or it would require uh, either putting in bone grafting or a core cord transfer technique. And then, if it's uh, greater than greater than 25% on an off track lesion, then you, you then you do both. Most people now are lowering this number to more down around 10 to 
uh, rather than the 25%, which is classic? Um, uh, sometimes uh, you cannot be too dogmatic on, on, on these things. Yep. Um, so you, 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 you sometimes do more more than less once you get into the situation because when you start thinking about uh, using the glenoid, um, uh, one of my favorite procedures of all time, uh, it's an open procedure. So uh, I guess we'll talk about that uh, later. Yeah, well, yes. We, we so so uh, the, the, the measurements become, uh, as you know, John, you know better than I do. Uh, uh, it, it, it cannot be um, uh, too yeah. precise like these uh, papers indicate. Right, yeah. So this is just another paper from uh, Burkhardt's group where it just shows here's the glenoid, there's the, the, the uh, uh, the articulation of the humeral head in different positions. And so as long as the hillside lesion is small in here, you'll have articulations on both sides and you won't get an engaging lesion. If the lesion goes off to the side here, then uh, you'll, you'll engage and, and have problems. And uh, here's an example where you have a large uh, bank heart lesion here, and then it's, it's going to get caught and you're going to engage the uh, the hill sax lesion because the hill sax lesion is too large and goes beyond the, the, the glenoid track. So this would be an off track lesion which would be engaging. Uh, and here is a case where if the hill sax is small enough, then you're going to have articular cartilage against articular cartilage and it's going to be an on track lesion and will not engage. If the lesion is larger, it'll come out here, and then the glenoid will articulate with the hill sacs, and it will be an engaging or an off-track lesion. And just another off-track lesion. Okay. Okay, so uh, so, so that's why we, we do these measurements. Uh, and this, this just shows another, if this is where the lesion is, and there's the tract, then this is going to be an on-track lesion and therefore will glide smoothly. And here the lesion goes off track, in which case it's going to engage with the glenoid and you're going to have a clunk. So, yes. And you can do measurements at the time of arthroscopy as well. But uh, m most of the arthroscopes we deal with really want to know what these numbers are by imaging before they go in so they can plan the surgery. And that just shows here's the hill sax lesion here. And you can do these measurements. It's a little bit more awkward at the time of surgery, I think, than it is on the imaging studies. It just shows all this degenerative change here. And the lesion. And here's the hill sax over here. And just after repair. So uh, I think you've all done these measurements, so I won't go through. Uh, anymore how to do this. I think we've talked about it. In that little segment here between the edge of the bony bank card and the infraspinatus tendon attachment is called the bony bridge. I think with, with, MR, with MR is all I, I just measure the uh, margin, the medial margin of the hill sacs out to the uh, uh, to the infraspinatus insertion. So I just directly measure the hill sacs interval. Right. Where did we get the, the, the 0.83 from? The 0.83 is from a cadaver study where they found that uh, uh, if they did different uh, cadaver injuries, that this is empirically the formula that would give you the track uh, size, the, the, the width of the track when you measured it. Yeah. Okay. We've already talked about that. So. Uh, I don't remember who's next, so Jennifer, why don't you take this one? The 20 year old baseball pitcher with pain. Should I see some cortical irregularity of the anterior inferior humeral head? And I think that's it, the middle glenohumeral ligament. 
there's some irregularity. Okay, injected there. Um, let's see. Coming down. Okay, so it looks intact there. And oh, it is torn. Okay. Yeah, it looks like an arthrogram. Um. Good reason why I don't like arthrography. Uh, so uh, she, I guess, thought that this was a tear, and I guess this was confirmed as a tear arthroscopically. But when you do arthrography, this is, becomes very difficult because we often inject into the, into the middle ground humeral ligament here, or, or a contrast can follow back along the, the track into the middle ground humeral ligament. So I think these these kind of injuries are difficult to to uh, uh, make the diagnosis of if you're doing arthrography because of the potential complication of arthrography. But I think this was a case where this was a documented middle glenohumeral ligament tear. Okay, 14-year-old baseball pitcher with pain after throwing injury. So it looks like there's edema in the posterior lateral superior humeral head. Um, so that's kind of in the region that you'd get a anterior dislocation, but it doesn't really look like it's impacted. But it does look like there may be a defect along the anterior labrum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks like it's separated. Or is that just ligament? That's probably ligament. Yeah, that's the middle glenohumeral ligament. Okay. And we're following it, and it attaches. Yeah. So we're seeing right there on that sagittal view, kind of a tear of the middle glenohumeral ligament. So what this was. Uh, this patient had an impaction back in this area, and then. That this was a tear of the middle glenohumeral ligament in through here. And a little bit of, uh, I think at surgery, they also found that there was a little bit of a tear of the superior glenohumeral ligament as well. It should be up in here. So it's primarily a, te uh, a tear of the middle glenohumeral ligament. Okay. Ashu, what do you think of this case? One would wonder um, if if this kid would ever have dislocated his shoulder if he was not a pitcher. Yeah, I don't know. I suspect that that might have been the case. Uh, although you don't see a heel sax lesion as big as um, as you'd expect with an acute injury. Um, I, 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 although I, I kind of look at this image on, on the right and uh, I wonder whether that's the case or not. Yeah. Um, he, he, he probably did dislocate completely. Probably. And probably. And, uh, he probably was able to ret uh, also uh, get it reduced right away. Right. Yeah. Can you just throw it too hard? Just throw it too hard and kind of pop it out? Pop it out. Possible, I think. If that's the case, then he's a, 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 a loose capsule fella. Yeah, right. Ashu, what do you think of this one? So uh, we have the axial sequence of a 15-year-old male with shoulder injury and after a rugby tackle. Um, looks like that anterior labrum uh, doesn't look normal. There's a lot of signal. And really, I think it might be detached there. Um, coming back in. Uh, it looks like actually that might might be a, some, a defect of that 
here we'll head some some that margin doesn't look as clean there's a lot of edema within that infraspinatus too along that infraspinatus i don't know if that's a that's just a tear um right there yeah and some retraction yeah i see some retraction there looks like some muscle strain and a great and, and some retraction uh, supraspinatus and infraspinatus is uh, not uncommonly um, injured t uh, together, um, as far as I know. Yeah, I, I think this is a, probably a tear. The tear is minor, <laughs> maybe a little bit of bone fragment of it in the <laughs> posterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. Uh, that's that's lower than usual yeah. for sure yeah. yeah so this is an unusual injury a reverse hegel injury what happened to the anterior labor was it just an injury or uh i'm not sure what's going on with the anterior labrum here i don't see any fluid going through there but i agree with ashu that the signal is not normal but i wouldn't call that a tear but we, we do see that that posterior capsule is torn over here and there it's uh, humeral attachment Okay, so here there's some increased signal intensity along the anterior labrum at the chondral labral junction. If we followed that, that may be a labral tear. Oops. Mm -hmm. So Okay, so I think that there's a labral tear and humeral avulsion of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. This could be another Hegel lesion. So there's a significant amount of edema in the superior humeral head. Looks like there's kind of a linear, yeah, so it kind of looks like an impaction fracture. Um, and then the anterior labrum does not look normal. And it looks like there might be, a, there's like a separation that goes through the, it involves the cartilage and maybe the anterior most margin of the glenoid. Possibly, and there's a little bit of bone, bone marrow damage within the glenoid. So this just looks like a minimally displaced, like bank, bony bank heart. Yeah. So. Or is so, kind of this. So here we have a post axe, and then here we have a. So are, are, are we just seeing periosteal stripping? Then, if it's a perthes? Yeah, okay. That's the labrum that's torn. That's the periosteal attachment. And this will tend to thicken pretty rapidly uh, uh, later. And there's a there's a tear right through here. So this is acute hill sacs and acute perthes tear. Okay, uh, Ashu, what do you think of this one? So, um, with two axial images, and I there's there's irregularity of that anterior labrum. Looks like. Um, Looks like that's it's torn, um, and honestly, the periosteum doesn't look stripped. I, I don't really see the perthes here, but I just see the tear. Maybe that's yeah. Maybe that's a very thin. Perthes is where the uh, labral periosteal attachment is uh, maintained. To be honest with you, it doesn't matter. I, I don't call these perthes anymore because it doesn't matter whether it's the like the periosteal attachment is torn or not. They're all treated the same. But just to show you that this would be acute uh, you, you took that out of my mouth, John. <laughs> and then this is six weeks later, the uh, same patient. What do you think, uh, uh, Ashu? I think there's is actually here I can see some periosteal reaction, right? It, it's thickened yeah. um, from before, and it's kind of grown back in almost. So that, um, it's six weeks, and look. 
we've, we've often say that uh, when you see thickened tendons and ligaments and structures, that that's due to prior injury, right? And scarring. And this just shows it doesn't take very long for this thickening to occur. Uh, and this is the uh, uh, just six weeks of the body trying to heal itself here. Okay. And then here you can see that this is an injury to the periosteum all the way back to here with all this uh, reparative tissue trying to heal it. So that's just the ev evolution of what a Perthes lesion looks like over a fairly short period of time. And I think we've already seen this case of a uh, partial tear of the anterior labra where we can see a little bit better on the Abra view. Here, there it is there. Whatever. Perthes here, okay. Uh, Jennifer. So we have a 17-year-old with history of multiple shoulder dislocations. Um, here the anterior labrum, I don't see any fluid signal intensity cleft along the anterior labrum, but there's some slight blunting of the posterior labrum. Um, oh, there we go. On the Aber view, we can see that there is fluid signal going along the anterior labrum at the chondral labral junction, um, but it's not full thickness. So this is where you see there is a tear there, but the periosteal attachment is still intact. And here it's, uh, we just don't see it. So you see it better on, on the uh, on the Abra view. And again, this is one of our interest in Abra views. Uh, this is pretty uncommon in my experience to see a tear that better on the Abra view than on the regular view, but it, it, we've, we've certainly seen a lot of examples. But I've seen the reverse. I've also seen where they've seen better on the uh, regular view and less well on the Abra view. And on the overall, we really don't do the Abra views anymore. Okay. okay, Michael, what's going on here? So they're, I guess, along the anterior glenoid margin. Is that what we're looking at? Where there's this kind of intermediate signal density blob? Um, and do we have any history or is this a specific? Shoulder pain. Shoulder pain. Okay, so I guess on the PD fat set, it looks more like fluid signal intensity within it. So is this just a big paralabral cyst? Like after a labral tear? Yeah, okay, Ashi, what about this one? Um, just looking here. Um, it looks like the anterior labrum is kind of blunted, um, and uh, I don't really see where the rest of the labrum should be. I don't know if it's displaced inferiorly, but the posterior is a little bit blunted as well. Unless what's this little thing right over there? Yeah, I thought that might be a displaced labral fragment, but right. And then we have a hill sax, and <laughs> this is a not uncommon to have a displaced labral tear here and this then can get scarred down. And the reason it's important to mention this is if they want to go in and repair that, they need they have to free this up, put it back over there, and then do the labral repair. So this is a displaced tear. Uh, and knowledge of where this fragment is is important because it's hard to see that, I've been told arthroscopically, they can often be scarred down and they have to free up the scarring to get the labrum back over in the right position if they're going to do a labral repair. All right, so here we can see some irregularity and blunting of the anterior labrum, and it looks like there's a displaced labral fragment there along the anterior glenoid with some periosteal stripping, so I, I believe this could be an Alpsa lesion. Okay, this has the same significance of the other. You need to free this up if you're going to repair it put the labrum in the right location and then do the labral repair. Here's just another example of an Alps lesion displaced anteriorly with a tear and then the uh, labrum and thickened periosteal attachment anteriorly. So this was a patient. This was on 42107. And we can see that there is a, 
a big tear here displaced with displacement of the labrum here, uh, and the patient has an acute hill sacs. So that's that's the initial lesion. When I first saw this case, it was actually when the patient came back a year later, and this was the appearance. The patient had not had surgery. And uh, uh, what this is, is again, it's a labral tear. This is this this is the same patient as this. It's just that over a year, it's, it's uh, gone through a healing sequence. And this is the labral tear. This is that displaced fragment, which now scarred down to the anterior aspect of the glenoid uh, in that location. And this patient went in and had surgery. They then went in and had a, had a difficult time finding this, but with the MR help, they freed this up, got rid of, there's an overlying scar tissue which scarred it down to the bone, and they freed that up, uh, put it back in location, and repaired this anterior labral tear. Uh, and here's a labral tear where you can see an associated cartilage lesion. Uh, right next to it, that's called the GLAD lesion, glenoid labral articular disruption. And it's just a, a anterior labral tear with displacement here and an adjacent tear of the articular cartilage. And here's another situation where we have an anterior labral tear with the periosteal attachment intact and a cartilage injury here. And I think they like to know about the, the cartilage injuries. They have to figure out if they're going to do anything like a uh, 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 pr procedure here in the area where there's a defect. Usually it would be a microfactual technique. Isn't it true that a lot of times they don't do surgery on glass patients? Or do some people do surgery now? Uh, on their own many times, the glass lesions. It, it depends upon what's injured and the size of the injury. Uh, in this particular case, you've got an unstable anterior labrum. I don't think that's going to heal on its own. So uh, if you're going in to uh, re repair the labral tear, then you may want to do something with the articular cartilage, or, or, or may not. It depends upon the size of the articular cartilage uh, injury, whether you're going to do a microfracture or something at the same time you do the repair of the, of the labrum. So, Michael, what do you think? So, this is on 3505. Okay. Basically, the. Yes, yeah, noticing that on the last image, there's kind of quite a bit of thickening and indistinctness of the. almost kind of like the inferior labrum and inferior capsule. And the anterior labrum has abnormal signal, and I don't see like a displaced tear. In this case, I wouldn't talk about the articular cartilage either, but the patient came back with increasing pain about two and a half months. Okay, so now there's more linear irregularity within the anterior labrum. It also it kind of looks like it's almost a volsoft. There's also edema in the anterior glenoid, and there's probably delamination under the cartilage. So the glenoid lesions can be a little bit... Uh, difficult to see always, uh, often, uh, at the initial injury, uh, but this just shows how they can progress over time due to the loss of the articular cartilage. Uh, Hashi, what do you think of this case? This looks like another um, injury to the articulating cartilage of the anterior labrum and uh, anterior, anterior glenoid, and looks like, oh. Yep, looks like a cartilage injury there. Yeah, so that's another appearance of a gland lesion. Good. Okay, so this is a picture with pain and weakness. So here we can see um, osseous fragment along the anterior glenoid. This could represent a remote osseous Bankart lesion. It looks like it's scarred down, and I don't see any significant edema, so it looks like it could be chronic. It's a big piece of it here. Yeah, is it calcific tendinopathy? 
this just this turned out to be a huge awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so forty one year old female pain and aching for five months. So looking at the labrum, from what I can tell, the anterior labrum doesn't look that abnormal. Posterior labrum is maybe mildly blunted. Yeah. Okay, so on the next cut, if we're going inferiorly, that looks like there's probably a little mildly displaced anterior labral tear. And some traction changes, maybe. And the glenoid looks like it's... In I'm not sure about that. It almost looks more like a sulcus or something. Or so that's 822, 2014. The patient came back uh, with a, uh, a sulcus that was in the patient for about two months. So I can see the like middle glenohumeral separate from the anterior labrum. And we see that band there. So uh, it turns out that there was another. There's a structure here. This is the middle glenohumeral ligament. This is the anterior band of the. With a high in, so it's a high insertion, is it's it? High insertion. Yeah. So this is not a tear. High insertion of the inferior. Uh, Ashu, what do you think of this case? Um, looks like there is multiple low intensity structures near a blunted slash diminutive anterior labrum. I would have to scroll through this um, to see what these look like. Okay, so it's going a little bit more inferiorly. Okay, so it's attaching on there. Um, all right. And that looks like some intermediate signal. I don't know if that's a... Okay, so there's a cord-like middle glenohumeral ligament there. Yeah, yeah. and again, th this is this is a very deceiving. This comes down and doesn't actually uh, fuse with the subscapularis muscle and tendon. This comes down into the anterior uh, uh, band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. And this was a torn... This is a high insertion of the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament <coughs> with a partial tear of that anterior band. Go back again. So here's a little labrum, a prominent anterior band. This is middle glenohumeral ligament here. If we go down a little bit before, uh, this is part of the middle glenohumeral ligament. This is that anterior band, anterior labrum. If we come down here, there's the anterior labrum. The middle glenohumeral ligament is attaching here. That's the anterior band with increased signal intensity within it. And we go further down, that's the anterior band attaching to the humerus. So this is basically a partial tear of a higher high insertion of the anterior band, which is what we see here on the sagittal images. And so basically just to get used to the anatomy. Okay, well, let's talk about postoperative changes. So typically, if you have a typical anterior uh, uh, labral tear, what you'll do is typically three can be anywhere from one to, I think I've seen 11 before, uh, suture anchors here. You put in the suture anchors and you tie down and repair uh, the anterior labral tear. So this is a typical bank cart repair. And the vast majority of the time, people, in my experience, use three anchors but there's one surgeon famous for using a lot more anchors. And here's a low field scanner where we can see the artif metal artifact from the three anchors there. And on the axial, we can see a lot of metal artifact here. Fortunately, they don't use these metal anchors so much anymore uh, there. Now, it's sometimes difficult to, uh, with a lot of the artifact to see a normal anterior labrum. Usually when they tie it down, uh, it deforms the labrum and it looks much more blunted uh, than it would uh, normally without that sharp margin, but it still can be intact. Here's just other examples of glenoid 
uh, switch rankers uh, from repair, uh, which we see here. So these are interlabral tears, and this one had a tear of the labrum inferior to the area of the repair. Again, um, uh, suture anchor here. Here's a labrum. Here's that uh, uh, capsule coming around, markedly thickened capsule attaching to the labrum, and there's a little peripheral tear in the area uh, where the suture anchor is placed. And if we follow it down, we can see fluid going deep into the labrum here anteriorly. So this was a tear of the repaired labrum. Uh, Another example on a high field scanner of the multiple suture anchors here in the glenoid. Uh, one a little bit medially displaced. And then there's this big thing in Fairly, which was a little bit of concern. So we go to the axial images. We can see some of the suture anchors here. And we can see that this is a big tear of uh, that anterior labrum with periosteal stripping and displacement of the labral complex. So this was a big re tear. Uh, after the repair, this is someone who uh, suffered a, a, an anterior dislocation after the repair, and then when they dislocated, they tore the repair. Uh, Jennifer, here's a 24 hour. So this is a patient who had a recurrent dislocation after labral surgery, and they really wanted to know whether they should do another arthroscopic repair or whether to stabilize this patient, they should do a cord cord transfer procedure. <laughs> and we'll, we'll get to what those are in a minute. I know John, or actually probably next lecture, uh, John will be very interested in about those. I uh, can't, can't, cannot hear you very well, John. Okay. Um, but once you... Um, have a bank bank card repair. Um, uh, it, 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 it uh, probably is best to go ahead and do an open procedure with uh, with coracoid transfer. Yeah, Bristol. Yeah, Bristol procedure or letter J. So we'll, we'll talk about the difference between those two probably next time. Here we can see the suture anchor placement, but here we can see a marked. Uh, defect in the anterior inferior glenoid uh, right in that location. And then uh, here we can see that there's the, uh, there's been capsular stripping. As you know, Bristol, I mean, the uh, uh, Vanguard procedures are, are, are not as, um, uh, shall I say, they recur a little more than, than, um, uh, bony procedures, uh, i.e., a Bristol type of procedure. Um, I think it's more common. Mm -hmm. And so this was post-op. That this patient went on to uh, to a uh, coracoid transfer procedure. Yeah, the, 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 the bank cards are uh, number one. Uh, you really have to know what you're doing to to do the procedure. Um, and um, number two, that they, they, they have a fairly, um, uh, I don't want to say common, but uh, the recurrence rate is uh, a, a bit high right. uh, for my liking, from what I've seen. Um, I'm a bit happier with a, a Bristol, but then I'm old fashioned. Yeah, but I'm not a Bristol, but a, yeah, Bristol procedure. I'm sorry. A lot of people agree with you. It's still very controversial. So, what do you think of this one? All right, so here we can see a suture anchor in the labrum, and there is contrast signal intensity undermining the anterior labrum with some displacement. So, this is a recurrent labral tear. Well, not necessarily. It, it may be a, a, a procedure that wasn't correctly done. That could be true as well. So it may not have been, been fixed properly to begin with. 
So that could be true. And but here we can see the label tear extending upward, the thickened periosteal attachment here for the displaced tear. If we go up high enough, we can see the uh, Hill, Hill Sachs lesion with acute edema. So this would be probably acute on top of chronic Hill Sachs injury in that location. Uh, and it's not that uncommon in, in, in athletic endeavors. Right. Uh, Okay, and here, here's a case, 32-year-old male, limited range of motion, 516, 2017. We can see a large hill sacs lesion here, a large bony bankart fracture here with displacement of the labrum, so significant injury. Uh, another view, this is, a, 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 this is a prior study where we can see the large bony bankart. Again, these are, these are chronic lesions. And... Uh, if we look at the sagittal images, the prior study showed a, a defect in the anterior glenoid here, a lot of synovial thickening, and a large capacious anterior inferior capsule, which is commonly the case in recurrent dislocations because when they dislocate it, they stretch the capsule, and, and it can become very capacious there. And then here is the, where they repaired it with the suture anchors later. Here are the suture anchors, and they tried to bring the capsule down and attach it in a replissage procedure in that location. So that's what a replissage is. So uh, I think we ought to stop here, and we'll talk about John's favorite surgery uh, tomorrow. Okay? Uh, have a good evening, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Take care, John. Thank you, John. Stay out of trouble, please. Oh, that's hard. Um, what's interesting, I heard a study from um, from Denmark yeah. um, about six thousand people with um, wearing um, the masks and six thousand without, yeah. and the results the same. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, that's kind of interesting, and that's a large series. Yeah, it is a large series. Uh, um, but then there are a lot of differences in what is being sold on the market. That's right. Yep. Uh, some of them are. Some of those masks are useless. Yeah, um, well, take care. Okay, on that note. On, on that note, pleasant note. Okay. Great. Thanks.